And let's see. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona, with the wobbling screen. Sorry. Um, uh, thanks for joining us for another virtual event. Uh, we're always delighted to have our good friend John Lasqua back with us. Uh, he's going to be talking about his brand new book, The Missing Piece. And uh, John was kind enough to sign a batch of books for us. But as Barbara was saying earlier, they're, they're going fast. I feel like a used car salesman here, but they really are going fast. <laughs> um, but for the remaining copies, I'll put a link in the comments field on Facebook and YouTube, uh, should you wish to snap up one of the few remaining copies. And uh, if you have questions for John or Barbara, please don't be shy, put them in. Um, and Barbara usually will summon me back on screen towards the end of the hour, and I'll be happy to ask any question you might have. So Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. When I'm doing this, there's this really annoying bug flying around over my wine and I'm trying to catch it. So John, publication day, let me drink a little toast to you. Well, thank you. I never thought it was gonna get here because it was part of the supply chain, if you remember. I do. The problems, the problems getting things to uh, where they needed to go. So last November, it was gonna be coming out and now they said, well, let's make it March instead, so. I know it kept sliding forward, but I knew eventually we would get to do this. Now, I am I am wearing wine and I am drinking wine because John and I historically <laughs> drank a lot of wine together, <laughs> almost all red. Because John John actually one of his many interests and um, expertise lies in wine. I happen to love wine. I got to be honest. I have two cellars at home. I have an indoor cellar for the wines that are ready to drink, and then I have one out in the garage for, that where I'm going to keep and let them get a little old. So, well, you live in a convenient uh, place for all of that. And yeah, we were, University we of California, week. Davis is one of the powerhouse um, um, institutions for wine for budding vintners yeah. and unophiles and all that good stuff. So exactly. did the fires affect, uh, John, last year, did the fires affect any of your wine, particular wine, um, you know, vineyards that you loved or anything? No, we just, we were lucky. We went uh, to the east of us. And it was extremely serious. I mean, the whole two weeks or three weeks that the whole state felt like it was burning. But um, nobody was hurt that I knew anyway. And it didn't ruin any of my wine. Although some of the wine that was growing at that time, they're now coming out with it and labeling it Fumé, which has got, <laughs> which has got a little bit of the smell and, and the taste <laughs> of the fire in the wines. I love that. What a little cachet to yes. call it. Fume. Wonderful, is. which is French for smoky. So I love that. That's great. So I'm going to do a little nostalgia thing here because I was trying to remember, but I think I have this right. John, uh, first book came out in 1984, and I don't believe it was a mystery. Was that called Sunburn? Sunburn. That was a okay. literary book. Right. Um, and you won, you won some sort of, you beat out Anne Rice for, uh, in a competition. She will never let me forget it. <laughs> wow, was, I can imagine. She was unhappy about that, but I didn't even, I didn't even actually submit my story. My, it's a great, it's a great little moment in my life is I sent it to, I sent the manuscript to my old high school English teacher. And a couple of days later, he wrote back to me and he said, well, I read your book and it's terrible. And I said, oh, great, what, what should I do with it? He said, well, I would just throw it away and start another book or whatever you wanna do, cause this one's no good. So I said, well, thanks anyway, you know, hung up. The next day I get a phone call from this woman. She's crying on the phone and it's his wife. And she just finished the book and she just thought it was the most beautiful book she'd ever read. So she said, you know what? I was going to be putting my husband's work into these literary awards and submit them, but I'll just take your book and submit it. And sure enough, I won the award, the Joseph Henry Jackson Award for Best Novel by a California Author, 1978. That's a really inspiring story. I mean, but you, you know, you, you wrote your first book. Seems to me I read something that you wrote your first book when you were like 14, but it never really went anywhere. <laughs> I wrote my first book actually while I was in college, but I didn't show it. To, I literally showed it to no one. To this day, I don't think anybody's ever read it but it's in my archives. Well, I haven't read it, but I'm, I'm sure to know it. So we'll progress on. There's the Auguste Lupa mystery series, 1986, Son of Holmes, and 1987, 
Rasputin's Revenge, um, which were really yeah. fun. And um, they were not available for a while, but then when John became more successful, they reappeared. So that part was really fun for me. But what I remember, and I think I have this right, because Dead Irish, which is the first Dismas Hardy book published in 1989 and the big in 1990. And I think the first time that I ever saw John or that we spoke was in 1990 at the first Left Coast Crime in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And we were all walking down the street. John was ahead of me with, I can't remember who, and I was with another group behind. And I mistook him for somebody else. And I called out to him and said, you know, whatever. And John turned around very politely and said, now he said, I'm John Lesquire. And I was, I was mortified. But at the same time, I was just delighted to meet him. And, you know, gosh, John, look at this. It's 2022. It's and here we are, 32 years, years later. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. One of the things that I really have loved about this pandemic is they kept referring to the people at risk as the elderly. And then I realized that was me. <laughs> Which yeah, I well, I'm a lot more of. elderly than the kiddo, but exactly. you know, I think exactly. it's wonderful that we connected so early. John's career, I think, really left off when he wrote a book in 1994 called The 13th Juror, which yeah. I still think is one of your very best very best books. Um, what's the inspiration for that one? Well, my good friend Al Giannini is a lawyer in San Francisco, and he's my he's been my best friend since I was in high school. So he reads through my books and comes up with you know thematic ideas because I'm not a lawyer. I've never been to law school, don't know anything about the law really, but fake it pretty decently. But Al, he's he lives it. He lives the life. So he came up to me one time after I had written three of the Dismas Hardy books. And he says, you've got to write about this whole battered women syndrome, which I did not want to do at all. But he, he hassled me about it. He got his wife on, my wife on board. And it was like, okay, I've got to do this. So I sat down and I, write, I wrote the 13th juror. The 13th juror refers to a judge who can overrule a jury's verdict. So it's pretty interesting stuff. And it turned out to be a pretty good book, I think, as you say, one of the best. It's a marvelous uh, book. And I had, I had lived through something like that, not quite, but I was at one point a plaintiff in a medical malpractice suit in yeah. back in Tennessee and Virginia, which is extremely, it's very rare that a plaintiff wins a medical malpractice suit, but in point right. of fact, I did. Yeah. And the judge um, or the jury awarded me a lot more money than we had originally sued for. They were moved by the whole story. In, yeah. Um, and it turns out that the judge had a power of what's called editor and remediator. In other words, he could take a jury civil um, mm -hmm. verdict for money wow. and he can either enlarge it, editor, or he can uh -huh. lower it, remediator. And um, so he was petitioned to do that. Um, and he elected, in fact, to do neither. He elected to let, let it stand. But that was the first time, John, that I had realized, and this was in what was it, 1985, I think, that yeah. a judge could actually, you know, do that, could tweak a, um, a jury verdict. So when I read The 13th Juror, I was particularly fascinated by that. Oh, the stakes were higher in your book than they were in my case. Well, still, it's, it's very interesting stuff. The, the other thing that's amazing is that the whole, um, you know, judicial system is kind of rigged, as it, as it were. And um, to, to figure out a way around the hurdles, you know, which is what Al tried to help me with a lot, really was what made the book kind of work. The other thing that's so interesting is when the book came out, it was not exactly applauded by the entire world. It was just coming out as a kind of a small print, maybe 30 or 40,000 books. And uh, amazingly enough, it, the book came out in paperback and it came out right as uh, O.J. Simpson trial was beginning. And that's what made all the difference. I went, I went on the air and the radio right across the country. I probably did 130 radio interviews as the expert on the battered women's syndrome, which is kind of funny because, you know, as I said, I'm not, I'm not really an expert at it, but I got pretty good at talking about it, I'll tell you. You know, isn't it interesting that, I mean, some people can write one book and happen to score 
a social issue or something dramatic that's going on in the world, the, you know, the zeitgeist or whatever, I would yeah. be walking right for an entire career and never, never do that because you can't plan for it. It takes so long for a book to be written and get into production and finally published that it's, it's virtually impossible to write a novel for the moment, isn't it? Right. But the other thing I think a lot of people don't do who are starting to write novels is they don't base them on thematic elements. They base it on plot. And I think that's a little bit of a mistake because theme, theme is, I think, much more important than plot. And it drives plot. And if you have that in the back of your head, you're, you're going to be writing a stronger, bigger book that's going to have a lot more resonance, I think. You know, it's just, it's just occurred to me to wonder because I've been fortunate enough to listen to your musical expertise. You know, you play in a band, <laughs> you love a guitar, you brought guitar to the program, I mean, to the store and played for us. Do you think that, you know, in part, your thematic interest stems from, from music? You know, I've, I've really wondered about that question. I really am, I think it, it matters in terms of how I actually write the, write the words. I mean, you, you say that and it's kind of funny, you don't really think about writers agonizing over words, but I think all good writers do. And I think that's the way singing influenced my dialogue, for example, and my other uh, verbal assaults that hopefully work. But they do it because they're rhythmic and they're, you know, they feel good. So I do think there's a big songwriter element to the, especially the dialogues. Well, I don't think it's just the dialogue. I think the pace of your books has always been has always been excellent. Um, you know, they read, you, you're just, you propel the reader right through the story, but you're also good at, you know, the adagio and then the, you know, allegro, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, you're very good at, at the rhythm so that it isn't boring. It's not all the same. You're right. That's exactly, and, I, and that's what I rewrite for and reread for, to make sure that that ryth rhythm is, you know, pleasant to read and, and drives you in one direction or the other. Well, we just talked about John's first four, Dismas Hardy. And amazingly, we are now on the 19th. Good Lord. It's um, pretty amazing considering that nobody ever thought about that when the first one came out. Everybody was thinking, okay, there's one book and that's another, he'll come out with something else different. But I just decided I love this guy. I loved Hardy. I love Glitzky. I love, you know, all these characters. And I've stuck with them all these years because they won't let me let them go. Well, you have stuck with them, but one of the one of the reasons the series continues to read so well and is captured certainly I've read you in real time after all the way through um, is that you have you've changed the lives of the characters. You know, you haven't let them be static. You haven't let them sit in the same roles. So when we met Abe, Abe Glitzy, for example, or for a long time, he was chief of police, right in San Francisco. Right. And now in this book, he's functioning as a private inquiry agent, right. so to speak. And Hardy has gone through various transformations. And in this book, Wes Davis goes through one. Um, and then earlier you wrote The Hunt Club and you did three books with, um, with him. And he kind of is an auxiliary to some degree. I mean, there's yes. a, a link to the Hardy books, but they were basically, um, you know, for Hunt. Well, you know, I needed a little bit of a younger force, you know, out on the, out in the field of, you know, if you're not going to be writing real legal thrillers, that you're going to be writing mysteries, you know, and, and I decided at some point to write, you know, to get out of the legal side of it because I wasn't very comfortable and write, you know, a couple of mysteries. And to do that, I needed a younger, you know, sexier protagonist. And Wyatt Hunt fit the bill. He was perfect. He is good. Where, where is he? It's been a while since we've seen him. He's right now, he's, he's festering in my brain pan. Oh. He's, he's thinking he wants to get out and, and play a little more. Good. That would be wonderful. Yeah. I, I spent for my undergraduate career in the Bay Area and a lot of time in San Francisco, but it's a San Francisco. Very few people would ever recognize them unless you're, unless you're my age because it was a very formal city in 19... Yeah. 58 when I first went there people wore white gloves and they you know got all dressed up for the symphony and um, by the time by the time I graduated and, and finished in Stanford and moved back to the Midwest we had Haight Asbury you know the whole city had really changed but you have taught me a lot about how San Francisco functions you've always been interested in 
politics and the political structure. I'm not sure everybody realizes, for example, that San Francisco is both a city and it's also a county. So mm -hmm. it has police chief and the police department, but also as a sheriff. Um, and you, you know, is that where your friend Al comes in handy? Well, sure. I mean, I don't even, I didn't even know, you know, what jail people got arrested and got brought to, you know, when, and that's something you better get right if you're, you know, writing about it. So yeah, that's the kind of thing that Al would help me about. But most of the time, what happened with him is I'd finished the book completely and then he, I would just give it to him and I would, I'd hand it in and it'd be about this thick. And then by the time he was finished, it would be paper clips on every, every page there's a problem and the book would be like this big. I think that's slightly off the point of what we were talking about, but I think it's a pretty amazing truth. Well, we're not, I mean, digression is the whole name of the game here, so sure. that's perfectly okay. But I, I have enjoyed touring the city's halls of power, uh, which it was never anything, you know, I thought about when I was a college right. student. And I think John's done a wonderful job explaining how, how politics in a metropolitan area work. It'd be, it'd be really interesting at the moment because, you know, San Francisco has had so many um, interesting things happen, you know. Well, it's, it's, it's very interesting, especially if you're writing any kind of a law and order type book. Because yeah, exactly. If there's, if there's less of a law and order town in the country, I don't know what it is. Portland. I mean, especially now, it's really, you know, it's changed its dramatic, dramatic structure tremendously over the last five or six years. It really has. That's why I said, I mean, I, I, my San Francisco would be, un, you know, unimaginable. But you know what it always has? It's got weather. The weather is such a great thing there because it's always hostile. And it's, a, you know, it's everybody thinks California, you know, but really it's not. If you're talking about San Francisco in the Bay Area, you're talking about wind and cold and rain and sleet and, you know, all of those bad things. I lived in San Francisco four separate times. And every single time I got, I got driven out by the weather. Do you know one of my favorite memories of San Francisco was sitting over in Sausalito, actually, at Anjean's restaurant, place. and looking back at San Francisco and the Bay, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge would be on the right and the Bay right. would be in front of you and then the city. And it would just, it would be like you were at a theater or an opera house, and the, the fog would suddenly, or so, or shot from, you know, a machine would exactly. start coming in under the Golden Gate Bridge and, you know, move across and you could have a perfectly lovely sunny afternoon or whatever. And then all right. of a sudden this fog would come in and, you know, it would turn cold yeah. and it would be dank and you couldn't see anything. And, and you know, it's I grew really up in Chicago where the weather, John, would change on a dime, you know, if the yeah. wind switched off like Michigan. So it didn't surprise me that much, but um, yeah, San Francisco, you could never depend on, on the weather being anything other than changeable. Yeah, it's a violent, it's a violent change of weather quite frequently. So I really, you know, I love visiting it now because it just gives me grist for the mill. But back in the day, you know, when you wanted to live there and have a, you know, kind of a picnic someday, you know, you'd go out in the morning and it'd be sunny or foggy and whatever it was, three hours later, it'd be the exact opposite. San Francisco has a very proud cultural tradition too. I mean, the San Francisco oh, yeah. Opera, where I've spent a lot of time, the San Francisco Symphony. We used to go up there on Friday nights all the way from Palo Alto. Um, we'd have subscription series as undergraduates wow. and it was really important. There's the Palace of Fine Arts, you know, there's, um, so it was a very rich, cultural tradition. There were a lot of old families in San Francisco, mm -hmm. many of whom had really significant money. Um, yeah. And it was a small city. I mean, it's a city that um, to a great degree, you can walk or it has its iconic cable cars. I learned to drive. I learned to park in San Francisco. Man, well, talk about a certain experience. Once, once you've learned to park in San Francisco, you can park anywhere. Totally. That's what you learn to curb your wheels, you know. So curb your wheels, you know. Just last week, I was down. I went down Lombard Street in a three-wheel vehicle, and it was great. I love it. It's all—it's like auto slalom to go down Lombard Street. You've yeah. probably seen it with those little trees. Anyway, it's a wonderful city to write about, and I—I I do think that it has been a main character in in John's books, and one of the things that makes them 
so fascinating to read. So in this book, we have Wes Farrell doing a kind of transformation. So set us up. Tell us what, in fact, The Missing Piece, how do you open it up? Well, Wes Farrell used to be the district attorney. Before he was a district attorney, he was a defense, defense attorney. Well, defense attorneys don't generally become district attorneys because they are not prosecution people. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna be a prosecutor, then you can be a DA, but not if you're a defense attorney. So anyway, in this case, Wes just spent eight years putting bad people in jail, and he came to the job being a, a quote a liberal, and he wanted to you know be a defense attorney and kind of make things a little better for for the poor criminals. But over the eight years that he was the, the DA, he found himself becoming less and less. Um, sympathetic to the, the uh, criminals that he was putting in jail. And so he decided at one point, he was just sitting at the beginning of the book, he's sitting there going, you know, I just can't be a defense attorney anymore. It's just not in my soul. And that's what got the book started. And it's very interesting because my son, Jack is a lawyer and he's a defense attorney in San Francisco. Actually, he's a member of the defense you know, bar in San Francisco, in Sacramento, I mean. And what's amazing about this story is Al and Jack were sitting, we were all having dinner together and Al was talking about the Innocence Project and someone had just been released on the Innocence Project and Al said, yeah, as though he didn't do it. And my son Jack goes, what do you mean he didn't do it? They found DNA that proved he didn't do it. You know, blah, 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 blah. And these two guys got into it you know, really interestingly, they really felt passionately about their positions. And Al was a, a firm believer that just because people got out on the Innocent Project, they were still guilty as hell of, of committing the crime they were convicted of. Whereas Jack wouldn't go there at all. He said, no, they didn't do it. So anyway, this is what started this book off. All of a sudden I had a thematic, there it is, the theme idea again. But I had a thematic idea to work with the, um, the Innocence Project, which I call the Exoneration Initiative in this book, because I didn't want to come down on the Innocence Project. You but, know, I actually think your title, the Exoneration Initiative, is a fairer title than the Innocence Project, because by calling it the Innocence Project, you already color it, where yes. exoneration is really what we're, what we're talking about. And sometimes exactly. people are exonerated that are guilty, but because there were flaws in the legal proceedings that led up to them, right. um, they are, I mean, an example of which we may or may not see happen currently is the Giesling Maxwell trial. If the juror hadn't spoken up about, you know, his history, I think, I think I have this right, of sexual abuse and therefore, you know, may have colored the verdict. Right. Um, so, you know, I don't think, for me personally, it's just my opinion. I think she's guilty as hell if right. she ends up walking because of um, of what happened there. I would never sure. call her innocent, but it's possible that you could call her legally. Exactly. Right. Well, you know, it's a very nuanced um, d discussion. It's really yeah. not a very simple topic, but I think that that's what makes a book also work when you have something that's inherently a little little iffy and a little tough to explain. You know, if you keep at it and keep knocking at that same door, eventually you'll knock it over and get it get inside. And I think that's what's happened in this book, um, amazingly enough. All of a sudden, Abe Blitzky, you know, it starts out being all about Wes Farrell. And like a third of the way into the book, all of a sudden, Abe Blitzky shows up as a private, as you say, as a private eye. And he's working for Hardy's firm and, and Farrell's firm. And there's a big confluence of ideas that are, that, smacked together like an asteroid. And I think it's where the book really takes off. And it's very fascinating to me to watch the, the this is the, uh, when the plot takes over and becomes fun. Well, I mean, there've been, this has faced a number of ethical or moral dilemmas. At one point he was gonna quit. I can't remember which book back that was, but you know, yeah. he was thinking seriously about retiring. Um, and, you know, law firms, um, dissolve and regroup. I mean, sure. it's, a, it's a, what happens is being partners in a law firm is really like being a marriage in a lot of respects. And, you right. know, sometimes they break down or they end up in divorce or somebody dies or retires or whatever it all is. 
Yeah. But also Abe, um, did Abe, I'm trying to remember, did he age out of the police chief? Yeah, eventually, he he, what yeah. Happened? eventually he aged out. But before that, he was a, um, he, he got all the way up to assistant chief of police. Right. So he really became a, you know, a member of the hierarchy of the cops. And then he, he aged out and he was, you know, he had all these connections. One of the jokes that I tell that runs throughout this book is he leaves the hall of justice, but every time he comes back around, there's a whole bunch of people that still think he's the, you know, chief of inspectors. And they, it, it actually plays a major role in the, in the unraveling of the mystery of the book. But well, yeah, it's now I so can fun. easily see that if he had that, you know, that base um, that many people would assume he still, he still had it. Yeah. He was useful to, to, I don't think useful is great. He and Hardy were allies in a different way when he was um, in the police than now when he's a private investigator. Before he had to observe the boundaries of um, of the police, you know, right. the, the ethical and procedural and all the rest of it. And so it was, a, and Hardy had to go along with that. But now if Glitzy's a private eye and working with Hardy's firm, then a lot of those constraints um, and procedures go away, don't they? They go away and it's fantastic. If you happen to be a writer and you want to give the guy things to do, he can do anything he wants now. I mean, when, when he was basically, you know, a cop, he really, did, and he was a very serious cop. He did not break the rules at all. No. But all of a sudden now when he's out on his own, he's going, well, I'm just working for, you know, working for the man and the man needs me to do this and I'm going to do it. And it's fascinating to, to me to watch him kind of morph into a little bit more of a laid back in terms of the rules kind of guy after a lifetime of being Mr. Serious Policeman. Isn't this fun? I mean, you think these were real people. Yeah, I do. I think they're real people. <laughs> it's a problem. But they, they obviously live in your head. And, you know, you've had a lot of fun connecting with them and making them do things over the years. What what interested you in writing the, the, well, you've already mentioned the three hunts, but didn't you write like three books for Abe at one point? Well, when, you know, when I started writing, you know, these books, the Dismas Hardy, the first book, the second book, you know, they got nice reviews, but nobody bought them. So I wasn't exactly cleaning up at the bank and there was very little money coming in. So I said, well, this isn't working. I can't, you know, I can't keep doing this guy because nobody cares. So I decided I, I liked Abe Glitzky and I thought he was a very good character. So I decided to write a couple of books in a row with he as the main guy. And then as luck would have it, I wrote the 13th Juror long before all of this stuff. But when it came out in paperback, suddenly it was the OJ Simpson trial of everything we've talked about already. We had this whole thing going on. And all of a sudden my publisher says to me, what about Dismas Hardy? We gotta bring him back. And I'm going, why are we bringing him back? He says, because he's the 13th juror guy. That's why. So I said, well, and then he said, you know, and I'll pay you a little more money. And so he paid me a little more money and uh, suddenly it was making sense. But I never, I never really decided to, you know, make Abe the main guy. He just happened to stick around for two or three books. I love the way serendipity works. It, don't I remember that the, Dead Irish and the Big, those were paperback originals, weren't they? No. No? no, no they no. were always a hardcover? They were hardcover. I guess it's because they came out right before, around the time I opened the store, so they had moved into paperback right. by the time. Yeah, right. that must be it. Yeah. No, it was a big thrill when it came out, and they both came out in hardcover. And then Hard Evidence was this kind of forgotten book, but it's the first of the legal thrillers. And it was a big old fat you know, juicy book. And I really, really liked it. It start, starts out with a Dismas Hardy walking a shark, you know, in a pool in the Steinhardt Aquarium, trying to keep it alive and it doesn't work. So they pull it out and they're gonna autopsy it. And they cut open the shark's stomach and in the stomach is a hand, a human hand with a jade ring on his finger. That's a good beginning, I gotta tell you. You've had a lot of wonderful beginnings. You really have. What interested you in, um, because I don't think I've ever asked you about it. Why did you write two books in this sort of Sherlockian tradition? Was that just for fun or? Well, it was just totally 
totally just to practice writing. Basically, I finished, I finished college and I said, you know, I know the Holmes tradition pretty well. I just loved it. And I also knew the Nero Wolf tradition very well. So I said, what if I put these two together? And I said, hmm, that's a pretty good idea. So I wrote the first book, Son of Holmes. And no sooner had I finished that book than my publisher said, write another one. But since these were even before the Hardy books, we're talking about $1,000 for a book. Yeah. You know, which is not exactly what is going to pay the bills in Los Angeles back in 1985 or so. But I have those two books. I actually have great. them in my I love own those library. Books. Hmm? I, I really love those books. I, I read Rasputin's Revenge just about a month ago, probably for the first time in 10 years, but it was really fun. It is fun. Do you ever feel moved to do one something like that again? No. <laughs> <laughs> no is the short version of that. I mean, it's great to have that in your background, my background, but it's something I really don't want to keep exploring. So I remember that between book 18 and this book, you thought that you would take a year off. Um, yes, I did you? think that. I got, the, I got into the whole, I'm going to retire mode. And uh, yeah, yeah, I really was very serious. I was thinking about just quitting entirely. And then I remember I started, you really upset me when you said that. I thought, how can I go on without John? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. But I, I figured... You know, I'd, I'd already written what everybody has uh, got to do, and they were at the end end of their story arc. And the next thing I knew, I was sitting here at my office, and I gave it maybe four months of just sitting here not doing anything. And I went, God can't do it. I got to start writing something. So I started this West Farrell thing. Then, then Al and Jack had their little altercation, and I said, Well, I just got to write this book. It's just begging me. So. There it is. I'm so glad. I was really excited when I saw, when I heard from your publicist, you know, that the book was coming out and I thought, hooray, because every once in a while I run into an author who says, some people retire involuntarily. I mean, they have a health problem or their books don't work or, yeah. you know, a lot of things. Right. But John, John was at the top of his game when he said this, you know, so I was really depressed and <laughs> delighted to hear that um, it was only a temporary madness. In your well, um, it's a temporary madness. That's a good title. Um, a good but title. I'm, you know, I'm working on a couple more books right now. Just I'm trying to get the one that's going to grab me. But I've got 40 pages written on one book and 25 on another book and 17 on a third book. And I'm waiting for these guys to wake up and jump off the page a little better. Well, I'm sure they will. And after all, you know, it, at this stage, you're not under pressure to grind a book out to, you know, meet some arbitrary deadline, right? No, that's true. That's true. So that way you have the leisure to wait and, and see, you know, see what strikes you. I've always thought that John has a sort of instinctive grasp of, of the unusual. I mean, his plots never quite go where I think they're going to go, which is one reason they're so much fun to read. Um, so... Does that, you know, do you work hard on plotting or does oh, it, I, I realized that your inspiration for the book was yeah. in, in this book anyway, lies with your son and, and Abe having this discussion, but just because they talked about the Innocent Project, which you have now called the Exoneration Initiative, doesn't right. give you the whole book. No. Well, this book was, you know, it, it just built itself up as a mystery you know, and it became less and less a legal book and more and more a mystery. And I love mysteries. So this one was just fun. There was a lot of, you know, surprises and a lot of twists. In fact, I think more than any other of my books, actually. Well, they really are. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, a, it, it's, it's right here up in the front. So I'm not giving anything away, but a guy is released from prison, thanks to right. the exonerate. And, and out he comes. And the next thing you know, he's dead. He's dead. Um, would that was that always the sequence that you saw, or did that? You no, know, I that, can't remember that, whether you're much of a plotter or whether you're more of a, you know, a pantser. I didn't see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm mostly a pantser, but that particular moment when the guy was killed right away, you know, that just started the ball rolling, and then a lot of things happened right, right quickly that I wasn't planning on. You know the the arrest of the guy who was a defendant in the case. Um, it was a pretty nasty arrest, you know, very much, you know, a, 
uh, overstepping by the by the police, and it just became another subplot in the in the story. And I don't know, I just loved it, and I just kept kept pushing it, so it kept moving. Well, I'm excited that you're working on another book. What's going on with your music while all this is happening? Are you I'm, just playing for yourself? Or are you yeah, playing I'm just public? playing for myself. I've got calluses on my fingers. I was playing here in my office a half an hour ago. So I still, I still keep playing. But, uh, you know, I had a funny thing happen. I, I don't know if you can tell, but my voice is different. I can. And it was about three years ago, I had a, I had a sneezing sneezing and coughing fit that lasted six weeks. And it's, it scarred my vocal cords. It's true, I've been to three specialists trying to get it fixed. And they just said, well, we're sorry, but this is the way you're gonna sound from now on. So unless I'm singing, you know, Scotch and Soda by the Kingston Trio, I'm really, I'm really not the singer I used to be, even though I wasn't really great before. I'm really not great now. Well, you know, there are many, um adjustments that we have to make as we get older um, and, and voices voices are certainly one of them um, my voice is different than than it was too and there's not much you can you can do about it but you know here we are we're both healthy we're both productive and yep. you know can't no. ask for more than that um patrick do you want to pop in and join this discussion see if we have questions or if you want to contribute sure hey look at rod stewart uh, and he's made a <laughs> career out of having a raspy. That's a good voice. answer. Yeah. Yeah. Or Tom Waits. You can just do. Uh, I can do Tom Waits. Yeah. Tom Waits. Yeah. Um, well, since you asked, Barbara, um, indulge me with some guitar talk. Have you purchased any new instruments or? Actually, actually, I've got two new instruments since the last time I saw you guys. I now have a total of seven. And uh, the, the first one is my old 1958 Martin D28, which is a, just a beautiful old mahogany, you know, gorgeous guitar. Then the second one, believe it or not, is a guitar I made myself right here in, in the town next to Davis, which is, Dick, um, which is the name of, of Winters. So I went into Winters and I built a guitar. It took about six months and it sounds like a guitar. It looks like a guitar, it's a guitar. It's cool. Was it fun? The third, the third and most important one, I guess, is is a written a one that was built by my friend Cliff Graham, who uh, is a very skilled guitar maker, and he put a guitar up for auction. So I decided, well, I'm going to just start it off and see what I can do. So I bid a very small amount, and the next thing I knew, I owned the guitar because nobody else bid, bid on it. Wow. So. Now I've got a bunch of guitars if I can all, you know, if I can all get them out at the same time. But it's fun. It's really fun. Now, do you have a little home studio that you've set up? No, I have a guy that I worked with now for uh, quite a long time out in Vallejo. And that's another one of the California corridor towns. Right. And uh, anyway, it's a great, you know, it's a great uh, collaboration. It's a guy named Doug Chancellor. He's a great engineer. And you know what, while I'm thinking of this, I should say, actually, I've written one other song recently that was pretty good. It was for my son's wedding. Jack, who I've talked about a lot here tonight, got married in October and, uh, or maybe it was September, September. And uh, I wrote their song for the wedding and they loved it and I sang it at the wedding in spite of my voice. So, so there, fate. That's great. Um... Let's see, some questions have come in. Um, let's see, will you, have you considered bringing a Wyatt Hunt back into service? Absolutely. He is, he is as I told Barbara, he is right now chafing at the bit in my brain. And he's, uh, he's definitely gonna show up at least as a, an ancillary character, if not the main character in my new book. Oh. Wonderful. I really like him. And I thought the Hunt Club was a fabulous title. I meant to tell you that. I, I'm sure I did tell you that, but it was a no, great title for that book. Yes. Yeah, well, thank you. One of the funny things about it is um, I was sitting at my office typing another book, writing another book, and suddenly the, the words the Hunt Club just popped up in my dialogue. And I said, huh, that's interesting. And I called up my publisher, Carol Barron, and she said, 
we can we can sell the hell out of that title. <laughs> and she was great, and she was right. She said, "The next book, you know, you know your next book's going to be the Hunt Club." So there you go. And then you had Mercy and a number of others that were in that same period. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have a lot of just a lot of really nice comments from devoted fans. You know, uh, Brenda says, "I love these characters." Uh, it's one of the few series I've stuck with from the very beginning. Um, Cindy says, I've read every one of your books and enjoyed them all. I think I will reread the 13th Chur. Good. Good. Yeah. Um, let's see. De another Debbie says, Poison was the first book I read. I don't know why I didn't know about the series in my favorite city. Uh, she is currently making her way through the series. Good. Um, I have a shout right. out for the... For the secretary Phyllis, we have a fan of a Phyllis fan. <laughs> Phyllis was a she's really something else, I have to say. She was in the rule of law, right? I think she's the one who's the defendant in the rule of law. Now we have some plants here in the uh, comments field. I, I, I think um, somebody named Jack with a name that's very similar to yours. Um, says, of all your characters, who is your favorite? Wow. Of all of my characters? Mm -hmm. I'd have to say Wes Farrell, believe it or not. And why? Yeah, I just like Wes. He's, um, he's funny. He's irreverent. He's uh, a goofball in many ways, but he's also kind of like a regular. He's, he's more a regular guy than the anguished, hardy you know, and they're really bully, bully, not bully. Uh, you know, hard ass Abe Blitzky. He's not that, he's more a regular guy and I just identify with him. I wanna give a shout out to Disney Hardy's wife, who I oh, think you know, plays wonderful roles in these books. Yeah, she's got a real part. Well, my wife Lisa is a powerhouse and she's a wonderful person and they go together. And I think Franny is very much a compilation of a lot of the things that I love in Lisa. Forgive me if you've already answered this, but um, where did the name Dismas come from? Dismas is the name of the good thief on Calvary during Jesus' crucifixion. Oh. And, and he is also, as it turned out in the Catholic Church, he's the patron saint of thieves and murderers. Now, when nice. you have that, how can you have a better, you know, better name for a guy who's solving crimes? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, Hardy is, I believe, from the Hardy Boys, you know. So I made that overt, I think, in the Mercy Rule. I said Hardy's parents, you know, whoever the Hardy Boys' parents were, got killed in a plane crash. But it was overt that they were, that he was, you know, he was going to inherit their name and, and their legacy. San Francisco has a lot of, of old institutions, restaurants and bars. I mean, the Buena Vista Cafe is one of the, yes. my fondest memories. I'm probably the only patron they ever had because they're famous for their Irish coffee. Sure. And I'm the only person they told me that ever went back up to the bar and asked for seconds on whipped cream. Everybody else <laughs> wanted more Irish whiskey, but I was <laughs> diluting it. But um, so the Shamrock, you know, did you, is that a real place or did you? Shamrock um, is a real place that I was really the bartender at. I was a bartender when, when I was just getting divorced from my first wife and I was living in San Francisco and I came into the Shamrock the first time and I met a guy whose name was Mike Mahoney and you can then see the change over to Mike, from Mike Mahoney to Moses McGuire and he said, you know, writers can't buy anything in this, in this bar. Ooh. Puts, down, puts down a glass in front of me and I had, you know, my friend had told him I had won this Sunburn Award and he said, this is fantastic. You're not going to be drinking here. So I started drinking. And before no, I knew it, I was behind the bar. And then I got on Thursday nights and Sunday nights. And I wound up being a bartender there for about six months. Which, of course, has something to do with Dismas, right? Which, I love of course, that. Dismas starts out when we meet him. That's what he's doing. Exactly. Yeah. You could probably draw a good comparison between being a bartender and being a bookseller in the sense that you get to hear, uh, um, you get to learn an awful lot about your customers. Um, you know what I mean? You know, that is so true, Patrick. Honestly, retail, I, you know, I thought 
that um, that the law, being a lawyer, was a window into people that was hard to beat. But it right. has nothing on retail. It's really incredible the things you learn about people and and you know for good and for bad and how you can get entwined in their lives. It's really mm-hmm. been. You know, Patrick has been doing this almost as long as I have at the Poison Pen. And would right. you think that's true? That, you know, the things that we sure absolutely learn about customers or, you know, bond with them. Patrick gets like care packages from devoted customers. You know, at Christmas, you can hardly stagger around under the weight of the stuff that people get Patrick. That's so great. That is so great. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. I'm going to be talking with uh, uh, Jane Ann Krentz and JT Ellison on Friday about we're doing this project kind of like an oral history of the bookstore of, of, of the poison pen bookstore. Yeah. Not to, oh, not that's to, great. Not to, uh, it's not, it's not event, us. Jane Ann, Jane Ann Krins and JT Ellison. Um, I've done a number of conversations with them about the rise of the Gothic, which is kind of the, the new big thing. And they asked if they could interview me and the staff and, you know, do a kind of thing called behind the pen. And I said, sure, um, but my only condition was that all of the staff needed to be ruthlessly honest in their answers. I didn't want anybody ducking for cover. Sure. Um, so I haven't actually, Patrick, I did the first one. I haven't watched the ones that John and Karen did or or you, but what I'd like to do when it's all done, it would be to put it all together in one place. Yeah, it's a great fun. idea. Yeah. Well, um, it, I think it's very kind of them to do it. It's a big commitment okay. on their part, but right. it'll be fascinating to um, to see what everybody what they everyone gonna... thinks the bookstore is and what they're what what it's brought to them and what they think it brings to other people. Are they going to be releasing it as a book, or is it going to be a podcast, or what do we? It is a podcast, actually. Wow. Um, one of the things that we've done in the pandemic, and this is my husband, we neither Patrick nor I get any credit for this one. Um, he turns all of the Zoom recordings, the one we're doing at the moment, uh-huh. into podcasts. And he's up at, I think, now 156,000 downloads. How many? So we've done 156,000 Holy downloads. This is, we're very close to 700 Zoom events in the last two and a half years. Holy smoke. Well, you know, we always did this, John. I mean, when you know, all the years yeah. you came to the store, we videoed them and Right. Um, I remember, but, but Zoom many, many and hmm? I said I remember many, many good discussions between you and me. You bet. In those videos. Oh yeah. But um, but what's happened is Zoom is is a clear video. Patrick right. has mastered both Facebook and YouTube as uh, streaming channels. Right. Rob has done the podcast thing, and you can download it on various. This is all on our website. And now we have a better video studio in the store, although we're still working on the audio part when we're recording in the store as opposed to, to talking on, on Zoom. But we did, our, we did our first video event in 1995 with P.D. James. Wow. Well, you have been holding up pretty well, let me tell you. It's pretty great to see. Well, it's, um, it's been a lot of fun. But Patrick, don't you think every, every member of the bookstore staff has a different a different bookstore? Oh yeah, sure. Which is what's sure. so interesting. I don't want to, I don't want to be remiss and, uh, and miss some of these good questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Josh wants to know, he says, in the years that you've written about San Francisco, uh, how has it changed and how has that impacted the stories you tell? Well, Josh. it's changed dramatically because the, the ethic of the city has changed. It, I think a lot of it is driven by the whole homeless problem in San, in San Francisco. There's a huge, a huge problem with, you know, like every, many other big cities. But San Francisco has opened its arms wide in the past th- two or three years to help people who are homeless, help in that situation. And what's, what's happened is, like, like you wouldn't be too surprised to hear, you know, people started taking advantage of that and then coming into the town because they took it as an example of where they could come and live. And the day-to-dayness of, you know, the, the homeless problem, you know, on the streets is different now. It gives a different feel to the city than there used to be. And I think it's a terrible tragedy, but, you know, people are trying to solve it and I hope they do. Um, let's see here. Lily 
uh, asks, she says, would you please ask John if, if he has any plans to come to the Lafayette Library soon? I'd enjoy seeing him in person again. <laughs> well, I was just in Lafayette last week, as it turns out, but I wasn't at the library. So I'd say there's a pretty good chance that I'm going to come to the Lafayette Library again. I've been there several times and it's really been fun. Uh, let's see, Fred, Fred asks, have you ever considered writing another standalone book? Well, I wrote Fatal about four years ago and I really thought that came across very well and was, was very well received. And I think I'll probably do that as my second book after the one I'm writing now, because I'm pretty committed to writing a Dismas Hardy book next, even though it's gonna be a Wyatt Hunt Dismas Hardy book, we'll see. Um, well, maybe as a final question, unless somebody comes up with some others, um, who do you like to read, John? Who are some of your favorite writers? Are there people that you go My, back to again and again for inspiration? Yes. Well, I don't know inspiration so much as, you know, interest and, in, you know, entertainment. I have been going through a period of time where I've just been in love with Chuck Box. You know, he's one of my favorites. He's the nicest guy in the world, but he writes these tremendous Joe Pike stories that I just love. So I'd say he's my number one favorite right now that I've been kind of hooked into. Anybody else that you've been reading for a long time? Well, I love Lee and I love Michael Conley and, you know, yeah. Don Winslow is just a monster. You know, I'm really, I think, plugged into the, the thriller set. And those guys are really good writers and they're fun to read, you know. But in the case of C.J. Box, you know, he just found a certain key to open up the, you know, floodgates of acceptance. And he was great. Have you seen... Um... Joe Pickett, it's it's been on some not so visible channel, but it's coming to Paramount in shortly. Is it? Yeah. Well, more power to him. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it. It'll be interesting. It was shot in Calgary, which, according mm -hmm. to CJ, is a decent substitute for Wyoming. Yeah. Well, you know, his stuff I figured would make great movies someday, and now that I'm sure that they will be pretty good. Any, any movie interest at all in the Disney No, artist? it's been the most frustrating part of my career. I just don't understand it. I think I've got the perfect, you know, the perfect books to be, yeah. you know, made into film, but nobody's buying them. So I'm just, you know, not worried too much about it. I don't need it, but it's a little bit frustrating to say the least. I would think that they would, you know, long form television has really seized upon long running series. So maybe part of the problem is that you'd have to film it in San Francisco. Well, that's part of it, I'm sure. You know, but there's also the whole idea that there's a lot of crime shows out there. And this one's kind of a low key crime show, you know, because it's it's very. Um, what's the word? It's it's very um, thoughtful. And it's not the same as, you know, shoot up everybody every two scenes. we got to have some bullets going by. Yeah, but there's a lot of action in your books, John. And, and it's, um, they're thoughtful, but there's a lot of dialogue. You know, part of the, I mean, if there's too much interior dialogue, it doesn't, doesn't film very well. But you've always been really good at, you know, conversation. Yeah. Well, I, I'm with you. <laughs> I think so, too. But, you know. There haven't been many, uh, you know, good, good kind of legal thriller sort of TV mm. series, unless I'm missing, which I could be, but have there been- No, it's been more cops, and, more cops and private eyes, really, you know, yeah. other than Perry Mason, whom we all sort of, you know, know Grew about. Um, yeah. Not so many lawyer-driven ones. Yeah. No. Well, um, it's interesting. I mean, you know, it's not like we haven't been trying, but we just have not had any bites, so. Well, who knows? Let's hope it will come along because I think they'd be, and I, I think your characters would be really interesting to cast and watch them. Well, develop. plus, you know, I mean, I've got 21 of these books. I mean, and each book has got five subplots. So, I mean, there's a, there's a hundred episodes right there. It's really pretty crazy that nobody's picked them up yet, but maybe somebody re watching this video will say, hey, I'm going to call that guy up. Well, I understand, Maybe, Barbara. If you get the call or anybody gets the call, there just don't hesitate to call me. I've actually got an idea, which I won't broach at the moment, but let me see what I can do. Okay. Anyway, Patrick, anything else? Um. Well, Michelle, one of your one of your viewers says, "I agree. 
I would love to see John's books, his characters, and relationships on the screen. Yay. Right I on like the show. Yeah. That's about it. All righty. Well, John, it's just wonderful to connect with you, even if we waited from November all the way to the end of March. I wish I, I had been able to predict. When the next book comes out, you'll be able to come back and see us, and then we can go out and drink wine for real. That's the goal. I'd love to do Excellent. that. I love that. All right. Well, good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And let me, Patrick's holding up. So let me remind you that Jen did very kindly sign copies of The Missing Piece. And we still have a few left at the Poison Pen. Um, and we mentioned the podcast. So you're welcome to share the video link with anybody because uh, these stay up there forever and they're free. But the podcasts are too. So if you go to poisonpen.com, poisonedpen.com and click on podcast on the homepage, then you have a choice of all kinds of podcasts, which will be from tomorrow forward. As long as we're right. saying this kind of good stuff, um, if you're watching on YouTube and you subscribe, we'd appreciate the support. I'm not sure what that does for us, but I think it's important. <laughs> so uh, let's do something, right? Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've really been, I meant to tell you, Patrick, it has nothing to do with John. Um, the YouTube audience has really been growing. It's growing, yeah. I think people are, you know, I think it's the more, yeah, it's just a, a bet, you know, an option for people that aren't on Facebook. So, right. yeah. anyway, good night. Good night. Thank Great you. Great to see you, John.